Ruby gets Tom's attention, then gets him to switch the dial to the bottom long enough for her to open the small slot in the wall and retrieve the fourth paper scrap. She signals Tom, and he switches it back again, opening the Z-hatch. Ruby returns to the dummy room. Listen, I... Tom begins to apologize for his earlier rash action. Ruby quickly dismisses it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Ask Tom to return dial to North Symbol. Get out and have Tom plug in the keypad. Ruby reopens the Z-hatch. Tom returns through it to the other side and plugs in the extendable power cord from the digital lock upstairs. Enter the code from the paper. Ruby and Tom return to the top level and enter the code into the powered up terminal. This is it! Not quite as planned. Tom and Ruby make a boring excursion back downstairs through the Z-hatch, unplug the cord, pull it back to the proper side, change the dial to the symbol in the water, then climb back upstairs. But it's all very boring, so let's just skip that and get to the good part. It's what Ruby would want. She doesn't mess around. Prepare to swing crowbar and walk into the doorway. Tom and Ruby prepare themselves. But there's no one on the other side. The monitor system appears to have been destroyed. Nothing to do now but use the cross peg on the cross-shaped slot. Ruby finally inserts the cross peg into the cross-shaped indentation in the wall. The panel on the wall transforms before Ruby's eyes, folding open and revealing a small ladder on broad pegs, leading up to a newly opened hatch in the ceiling. Ruby and Tom climb the ladder to the new hatch in the ceiling. It's no mystery whose home this is. Analyze object under the tent thing, then the bloody hole in the wall. There's a cereal box under Red's tent. On the wall among endless scrawls of illegible fevered writings, there's some sort of crude arcane circular diagram, and in the center, a relatively fresh bloodstain. Probably from some time in the last few days. Looks like someone hit their head here. Very hard. Open the cereal box. There's a very sugary cereal inside, but there's very little left. Something rattles inside the box, which promises a prize inside. Something falls to the floor from the cereal box amid Red's fevered writings. Are those... teeth? Examine them to determine their true nature. They're teeth, all right. Ruby pockets the handful of teeth. Examine door. I was trapped behind this door, but Red let me out, so Red must be in there now? The door is locked, but Red is on the other side. He might let us in, though. I mean, after all, he did let me out. Tom knocks. Red's voice comes from the other side, raspy and strangely excited. Hold on now, friends. Red can't let just anyone through this door. You have to prove your family part of Red's special family. <laughs> if you want to prove you're part of Red's very special family, you'll have to solve this riddle for me. I watch, I tear, I devour and <laughs> All these fall as liquid to feed. Now, why don't you go bring good old Red the answer and prove you're part of Red's special family? <laughs> the answer is an eye. Dun, dun, dun. Wrong! Now scram! Well, nothing to do now but open up the do not open box. Tom decides it's time to get down to business. Warning labels are for chumps. Stand aside, ladies. Time for my manly physique to prove its worth. And damn the consequences! There is a desiccated corpse inside the box. Its skin has become paper-thin and yellowed, half-transparent, clinging to its thin skeleton. It looks... Strangely familiar. Tom finds something inside the box. Tom retrieves the bowl of clawed fingers. Turn on the sink. The faucet pours red liquid. Actually, Tom's not that surprised. 
Tom retrieves the bowl of blood. There must not really be a corpse, or Tom would have reacted. Ask him what's in the box. A bowl of severed fingers is certainly disgusting, but no worse than some other things we've both seen. Take the blood, eye, teeth, and fingers, stick them in the blender, and get the god-awful smoothie. Ugh. Tom and Ruby head to the maintenance area, and after a gruesome blending, they whip up the god-awful smoothie. Take it to Red. The door is already open. Perhaps he knew Ruby and Tom were coming. Ruby and Tom enter the room Tom was trapped in earlier. The walls are covered in graffiti. There are numerous items here, including a shovel head, empty red spray can, Red's cane, and the remnants of another implement, broken to create one of the two stakes. There is a metal box here. The pneumatic tube here is empty. There are doors to the north and to the south. Red is here. Examine Red. Red's face is grotesquely deformed, with an impossibly huge grin. Red is impaled through the back of his neck and through the right of his skull by large stakes. Red is covered in blood and not moving. Red's dead, baby. Remove stakes. Ruby doesn't particularly want to disturb Red's body, let alone pull out thick wooden stakes jammed through his gray matter. Tom examines the metal box Red left. It appears unlocked, so he opens it. Look at the screen! The window! The screen is just static. Ruby examines the items. There is a metal tool head here that looks like it broke off one of the two stakes, but it does not appear useful in its current broken state. Tom opens the box. There is a note. Tom also notices a coin in the pile of stuff under the note. Ruby takes the cane and shovel head, but leaves the empty spray can and the metal tool head, as both appear unhelpful in their current state. The door to the north opens. A very large figure appears in the doorway. Ruby gets the very distinct impression that this individual is not friendly. Tom is distracted by the note. He reads it. Try and catch me now! <laughs> Tom discards the note as he finishes reading. There is something under the note. Suddenly a flash of memory returns to Ruby. The figure does not seem friendly. She remembers the figure. The figure is the one who put her in the locker. Call Tom and run out of room at high speed. Ruby doesn't see the bomb. Tom reacts quickly and runs from the room. He grabs Ruby and quickly carries her along. Tom runs as fast as his tired legs will carry him. Tom leaps from the room just as a huge, poorly rendered explosion erupts from behind them. The explosion blasts through the air around them, filling the room with heat. Ruby and Tom appear unharmed. The building around them still shudders from the explosion, but it appears the imminent danger is gone. The room to the north appears to have been filled with debris. It is now inaccessible. Thank the guy. Say something. Thanks for saving my life again. I, I just did what anyone would have in that situation. Tom blushes slightly. Would have been nice to have that coin since we've lost our spare one. I wonder why Red needed it anyway. It would appear Red used the two coins as some kind of makeshift context for his homemade bomb. Let's consider the strength of the bomb. Has this perhaps altered our other surroundings? We may want to check some other rooms to see if they've been affected, mainly the bottom half of the tube. The explosion seemed quite localized. The door to the north is inaccessible, and most likely, the room the explosion took place in is all but obliterated. But it seems like most of the other rooms are unaffected. The area as a whole does not seem to have had a particularly strong reaction. Scratch that. The lights in the room suddenly go out. Look at the tiny light outline. There seems to be a doorway hidden in the wall. A light comes through the crack from the other side. Perhaps the door was jarred loose in the explosion. Weapons out, and listen. The air is deathly silent after the near-deafening explosion. Ruby and Tom draw their scalpel and crowbar, respectively. We should ask Tom if he recognized the Birdman. 
see if he has any experience with him, and see if Ruby can remember anything more herself. I'm drawing a blank beyond the image of being put in a metal cell by the figure. I recognize them. It's the same figure that dragged me away into that room when I was suffering from arsenic poisoning. It would be good to see how the other rooms changed from the blast, too. A preliminary examination of the room below suggests there has been no extraneous damage, but the light seems to be off in most of the rooms. Go to the dummy room. There doesn't appear to be any damage here, either. Fuck! Mother of God, destroy the dummy! Tom examines the glowing eyes on the dummy. He can't tell what's causing the light. Ruby gets scared and backs away. Ruby, get a grip and stay the fuck away from that box. Ruby can't resist. She looks in the box. The box is empty. Try poking the red eyes with the scalpel. Tom uses the sharp end of the crowbar instead and jabs one of the eyes. It makes a squishy sound. Get out now. Tom and Ruby decide to quickly vacate the room. They head back upstairs. Open the door. <laughs> Tom grabs his crowbar and sets to work opening the door. It's stuck fast, but nothing a little manly physique can't handle. The door unceremoniously falls off its hinges and reveals a bright room beyond. Ruby and Tom check the room for obvious dangers, take a moment to let their eyes adjust, and then enter. There is a door to the west. The door to the north seems to lead to the room where Red's body was just found. It is inaccessible due to debris. Inspect the room. Tom and Ruby inspect the room. There is a bottle of champagne on the table. Tom takes it. There is a note on the other table. Ruby will inspect that in just a moment. On the north wall is the doorway to the room the bomb went off in. The heavy door has been blown to pieces, but seemed to protect this room rather well from the blast. The doorway is marked holding by a sign above it. There is a water cooler here. Beside the cooler, there is a set of metal shutters which are wrapped shut at the base with barbed wire. Drink the water. Strangely, neither Tom nor Ruby is very thirsty. Examine the hole below the vents for treasure! Arr. There appears to be something in the back of the hole, but it's wedged in there good. Ruby can't get it out with her bare hands. She'd need some kind of precise implement to grab it. Ruby examines the note. It appears to be some kind of official document. Much of the text appears to have been blotted out with a marker. Subject, Ruby. This note, it's about Ruby. Gender female, age, next of kin none, status medically viable, affected condition since birth, cell number seven. Recommendation, Ruby's makes her an ideal subject. She has no other injuries or medical conditions to speak of. She will be until a proper treatment can be discerned. It should be noted that in an emergency, no family. Willingly signed on to program, test results pending. Great care must be taken to avoid injury during treatment. Has been forewarned of the potential risks and received proper education on the dangers of treatment. Has never responded to treatment before. The note is mostly illegible. Something has been attached to the main note, however. Deceased? Tom can't see this. Ruby hides the note in her pocket. Oh, come on now. Stop endangering poor Tom. Stop endangering poor Tom. Hey, hey, you want to pop open this bottle of champagne? Tell him he can open it after they escape. That's fair. I was just trying to be upbeat. The champagne will taste much better once we're out of here anyway. Ruby inspects the objects on the wall. She finds, on the shelf, two walkie-talkies. Both Ruby and Tom take one. You can now directly control Tom. From now on, specify which character you are directing your action to. You can still have one character tell the other to do something, or you can simply command that character directly. Examine all doors. The metal shutters are bound tight with a coiled barbed wire. No amount of force from the crowbar will rip them free, and they can't be untied or unwound. Not with bare hands, at least. The door to the north, leading to the bombed-out door, is completely blocked with debris. 
Even Tom's manly physique would be able to clear a path. The stained wooden door to the west is locked. It appears to have a lock which is a link to the adjacent card reader. Smash it down, fuck the card key. <laughs> the card key locked wooden door is no match for Tom and his crowbar. Take that logical progression of puzzles. The door turns to splinters. Have Ruby scold Tom for such harsh actions? Actually, she's pretty impressed. Ruby compliments Tom for his harsh actions. Good work, Tom. <laughs> Tom seems pleased. Look into room before going in. A spiral staircase leads upwards. Yell up the stairs. Hello? There's a light coming from upstairs. But after Ruby calls, there's no response. Tom shivers warmly. As an after effect of his rush of manliness. Maybe set a new frequency for walkie talkies. A clever idea. Tom and Ruby set a new frequency together to avoid being listened in on. Check the other entrance to the bombed out room. What other entrance? Wasn't there an entrance next to Red's hideout? The room with Red's hideout and the monitors is blocked by a collapse of debris. Both that room and the room with the bomb are inaccessible. At least for now. What about the boarded up hole near the pit? The two choices seem to be either to go upstairs, or to go to the boarded up hole in the other room. Who should go where? Remember, now that they have walkie talkies, they can split up and work faster while staying in touch. What should they do? Send Tom to crowbar the boards and have Ruby climb the stairs. With their walkie talkies in hand, the two split up. While Tom goes off to pry the boards, Ruby heads upstairs. Because the staircase curved around, this new room is directly above the room Ruby and Tom were just in. Look at the fetus thing. There is a fancy glass display case in here. Inside is a strange statue of a polished, smooth green stone. It resembles some kind of almost fetal creature. It is very unsettling. Inside the glass display case, there is also what appears to be a severed finger. Tell Tom what you see, and have him report back to you once he opens the boarded up hole. Ruby reports her findings to Tom, who acknowledges them with concern. Be careful, Ruby. I will, I promise. Describe what's at the far end of the room. A door? A dispenser of sorts? Ruby examines the room. There is a ladder leading up with a sealed metal hatch at the top, and no visible means of opening it. There are two doors to the north, both with a symbol above them. There is a framed picture on the wall, with some sort of illegible archaic writing on it. To the east, there is a heavily reinforced metal door with an inset card reader. There are two plaques on the display case. The top one is illegible due to blood and rust. The second appears to be a request and or warning label. A key card slot is set just underneath the second plaque. Open the door without the blood and the feeling of seemingly imminent doom. The door on the right is unlocked. It opens to a small closet. On the north wall is a large glass front installment, like a vending machine, filled with all manners of pills and medicinal vials. There are two shelves here. On one shelf is a high-tech first aid kit. On the shelf above it is a pressurized oxygen tank, with an oxygen mask attached. May we see what Tom is doing? Tom is making his way to the boards. This room is very strange. Take the pressurized oxygen tank, and the first aid kit. If it's there, that means we're gonna need it. Ruby takes both items and adds them to her growing inventory. The first aid kit has a fingerprint lock on it. How high tech. Experiment time! Rip off a plank and throw it to the middle of the room. Rip off another and throw it to the other side. Tom begins breaking off the planks. He tosses one into the pit. It doesn't come back. Have Ruby use the spade to break the glass. The glass on the vending machine device is too sturdy to be broken like that. Apparently, whoever designed it expected that to happen. Okay. Is that a hole in the wall, I spy? There is a small hole on the wall of the closet. Tom finishes opening the hole down. There is a distant light from the other end. Attempt to bump the vending machine. 
Have you really never used a vending machine before? That won't work. Poke Kane in the hole. Great, it's stuck. Have Tom go through the hole. Tom arrives at the other end of the hatch. Tom feels strangely turned around. Radio Ruby about this development post haste. Tom radios Ruby. Ruby hears his transmission, but there's some sort of strange echo. Perhaps he's nearby. Examine fucking everything. There's a medical diagram on the wall above a stained medical examination table. On a small surface next to it is an anatomical eye model. Some sort of diagram is on the west wall. To the south, there is a locked door. There are some papers on the exam table. There is also a set of medical tools lying on the table. Tom, check the object in the upper left corner of the room. It appears to be a camera. Ruby, check third eye. See if it feels like it is still there. It hurts. Tom, agitate the cane and make rawr noises. Then call Ruby to say only joking. Ruby and Tom, realizing they're somehow on the opposite sides of the same wall, work together to free the cane. Inspect eye and look at the diagram. Tom inspects the anatomical eye model. It's just a plastic standee model of an eyeball, like the kind they have in medical schools. However, when Tom picks it up, he finds a single coin underneath the base, which he then pockets. The diagram in the back is that of an eye with some sort of strange script annotating it. It seems very archaic. Now the paper's on the desk. Tom picks up the papers on the exam table. Accident report? On October 29th, after five months of testing, procedures, and exams, we have suffered another setback to the project. Test subject number seven, aka Ruby, was the victim of a fatal accident. Ruby suffered severe fracture to the occipital bone, led to massive internal bleeding. Despite best efforts, she died. It should be noted that this accident comes soon after the death of subject number one, Stitches. Tom's not sure what to make of this letter. There's an attached photograph at the end. <gasps> Give the coin to Ruby. Use coin on vending machine. Get the damn key already. This is too much to take in right now. Tom hastily pockets the letter and the photo. There will be time to sort this out later. Tom shakily passes the coin to Ruby through the wall. Thankful she can't see him like this. Ruby uses the vending machine and the coin to retrieve the gold key someone stashed in there. Ruby noticed the door from the room outside the medical room Tom's in there was locked. Perhaps this is that key. Leave the closet and unlock medical room. Ruby can't open the door from here, even if this is the correct key. The doorknob and lock on this side are stuffed and tightly wrapped with what appears to be... hair. Ruby, re-enter closet. Give key to Tom to unlock. Tom is manly enough to beat hair. Ruby slips the key down the hole in the wall. <laughs> it promptly falls down the shaft. Ruby hears footsteps coming from outside the closet. Tom, you must retrieve the key. Tom goes down the shaft to fetch the key. The footsteps are still coming from just outside the closet. A figure appears in the doorway. Now! Stab out the neck! Now! Wait, no, don't attack it! It might not be evil, but if we wait, we might die. Uh... Ruby is so confused. Very carefully. Try to talk to him. Ask him what his name is. Who are you? Ruby demands to know who the figure is. Her voice is shaking, but she tries to sound confident. She recognizes that face. She's seen it twice before. She just didn't realize it was the same one. Until now. Stitches! Stitches recoils slightly. His sewn-up head wound begins to bleed. He staggers uneasily backwards, glancing at Ruby confused. How do I know y y you He shrieks in a hoarse, rattling pitch. Make Ruby say, that's your name, it says so in the papers. Ruby's papers don't mention Stitches at all. 
She's never heard the name Stitches before this creature shrieked it at her. Click the broadcast button on the walkie behind her back twice quickly. It'll give two sharp static cracks on Tom's, and hope he gets the idea. Tom receives two bursts of static as he picks up the key. Something very strange is happening in this room. Stitches pauses momentarily. His expression changes, and his eyes widen as he stares at his own hand. Ruby should tell her name. She heard Stitches speak it before. I'm Ruby. Stitches freezes. Again, he stutters. How do I know you? Yeah. He appears to prepare for an attack, then suddenly turns and flees from the closet, wailing a rattling moan. Stay away from me! I, I, I'll only hurt you! With that, Stitches is gone. Tom hears the screaming and rushes back, key in hand. Have Tom unlock the door and Ruby go after Stitches. Ruby nearly had a heart attack. She's not sure she should go after Stitches right now, even if she wanted to. And she's not sure she even wants to. Tom unlocks the door. Wait, read the diagram on the wall first. Tom examines the diagram on the wall. Clean up that blood. Unfortunately, it's soaked into the old print rather than simply hanging around the outside of it. Tom unlocks the door. Tom and Ruby meet up again in the hallway. Ruby! Are you okay? Don't worry, everything's gonna be alright. Ruby and Tom speak briefly. Tom explains the growing rift in the lower level. Ruby tells Tom about Stitches. Tom reacts strangely to the name. When pressed, he explains he read it in a medical document. Stitches was officially reported as dead. 